like the word the global south is usually used for uh, these regions because th that is definitely quite a diverse uh, community of the countries. And because of these, uh, many of them had different experience, different alliances and partnerships, different political uh, preferences as for now. So we have an extremely diverse picture. What we definitely know that Russia has been actively working for the last 30 years in all these countries, doesn't matter, right, left, democratic or more autocratic, Russia has been working because they had the uh, diplomatic presence. What Ukraine didn't have in many of these countries and didn't have the enough capacity and money to be present in terms of the uh, uh, political, in terms of the visits, in terms of the contacts, in terms of the soft power and public diplomacy. Uh, so now we are, de facto, trying to catch up with what we've been neglecting for many years. At the same time, we have countries that clearly immediately realized what is happening and took the strong position, like Japan. Here, no questions. What is interesting, Guatemala suddenly became one of the leaders in the Latin American region uh, who understood joint Crimean platform and we had our friends. With other countries, the problem was originally that we thought uh, um, they just understand what does mean the rules-based order, human rights, and how important that is. We underestimated that Russia played perfectly on uh, the anti-Americanism and anti-Westernism in many of these countries, and also presenting is as anti-imperialism, so all that Soviet narrative that worked well, meaning that Russia is against empires, not Russia is empire. And uh, uh, the question when we started to speak that Ukraine being a colony of Russia for uh, centuries, and we even received the uh, uh, surprise, like, you know, eyebrows in Africa, you are white, you cannot be a colony. So on the certain moment, we needed to reframe our narratives and studying, uh, explaining. We just realized that, first of all, many of these countries are not supporting Ukraine just because they don't know what is happening. Because they are perfectly living at the certain information bubbles, many of the information agencies are just reposting Russian information agencies because they're free of charge compared to Reuters, for example. Yep. So it's just came naturally and we need to break this uh, wall. And for this, what we really need to do is to go there and to speak directly with these people. Because sometimes we don't feel nuances, what touch people, what don't touch. A big surprise for me was, for example, that India being a nuclear uh, country, doesn't want to speak about nuclear security. They are not interested in this topic. That's not the topic that really touches them. But at the same time, they were absolutely uh, open to speak about food security. Even that we thought originally, I mean, yeah, our assumption that food security is probably more the question for the African countries. Then you came with some, I mean, that's really uh, so many nuances and details that without coming to the region, without speaking directly with these people, you would not be able to, uh, um, to feel uh, the moods and to understand the, the needs and what are the common topics. We suddenly received a very interesting support from Singapore who was very interested in disinformation and in maritime security. Small country, but they understand that because of their ethnic composition, because of their neighbors, because where they are, there is two spheres where maybe they don't care what is happening in Ukraine, but they care about experience of Ukraine. So we can speak uh, from how we can be useful for you by sharing our lessons learned and experience. It's not that we need to share the threat, because when you come to many countries, they openly says, but do you understand that you are not a global conflict for us? Your regional conflict. So explain us why we should care about you. Yeah, morally, we understand that that is bad, that you have refugees, you have destruction, everything. Yeah, Russia is bad, but why should we care? And that's to find these nuances, why they should care, what are those interesting elements, uh, and what are the transnational or even transcontinental effects. That's how we are getting these countries, because with many Southeast Asian countries, for example, we started to explain that we understand that China is bigger threat for you than Russia. You, the fact, don't care about Russia. Uh, but uh, look, China is now learning the lessons from Russia, both in terms of tactics, 
how war can be conducted, but also in terms of the international reaction. So they are looking, okay, sanctions are not effective, or what mechanisms we can prevent and mechanisms to implement, so your sanctions would not be effective to us. Or, okay, we understand that West would not go after this. Yep, that is their limit in terms of actions. Why not to try? Let us try to do this, this, or this. So, you know, all of these, and suddenly they start opening like, okay, so you think that China can go, let's say, attacking, yeah, it can be hybrid actions or direct, if Russia is winning because they understand that the West is weak and are not capable of uh, uh, like uh, facing this. We said, yes, we already see the indicators, and you have, like, you know, a switch. Oh, that's interesting. Let's talk now. Maybe we can help. So that is probably now we are in this period of, you know, uh, search of experiencing, of trying, of learning, uh, uh, but not only telling. And that is the huge difference between probably our uh, activities before 2022 and now, because originally we were coming just advocating. Now we are coming to learn, so to understand how we can be useful and interesting to each other. South Korea is not openly supplying us with any ammunition yet. Uh, that's what we are working on. Uh, uh, they try to do it uh, through the third countries because according to their legislation, they cannot do it to the country in war. Uh, and even in South Korea, where we've been in December, uh, I cannot say that the position is so strict. Uh, and uh, uh, on the one hand, they are absolutely recognizing Russian aggression and uh, that Ukraine is a victim and Ukraine needed to, to be supported. But at the same time, they are not imposing a lot of sanctions against the Russian Federation. Or they are looking at the situation as, uh, okay, but we can continue trading and doing some of other stuff. So they are still trying to balance. Uh, also, partially because of China and because of North Korea, they are trying uh, not to spoil relations with Russia that much that Russia would destabilize situation in their region. And that is the fear of a lot of countries, uh, uh, in, especially in Southeast uh, Asia. With Japan, that's a little bit easier because uh, let's not forget that uh, Japan is still, from the legal point of view, uh, in the state of war with Russia after the Second World War. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, they don't have the armed forces. So there are also limits to what they can supply to us. What still uh, can be done uh, from the region? Uh, there are not so many countries that can supply us with what Ukraine needs. Uh, because we don't have so many uh, uh, Asian countries that are producing weapons. They've been usually the uh, buyers of even Ukrainian weapons. Uh, but they are, some of them are important trade partners, and you understand that we need the economic activity. We need their voices in the United Nations and other organizations. That's very important. What is much more important, we need them to join sanctions because Russia is using a lot of, of these countries uh, to bypass sanctions of the European Union and uh, the US. They are using these countries for the gray export and they are using these countries for the supply of the uh, uh, technologies that are important for, uh, for the weapons production, uh, such as microchips, for example. And uh, the uh, uh, last uh, but not the least, many of these countries bought in the past to the Soviet ammunition and equipment. So now Russia is trying to buy it back. And sometimes even very, very old equipment like you uh, last year, it was the contract that they bought in Cambodia, the weapons that de facto been produced in 1950s. But who cares if it is the tank? This tank is driving so it can be used at the battlefield. There is no limit for Ukraine uh, to go on with not only Euro-Atlantic reform agenda, but also continuing to will to be a NATO member. Uh, but we have to talk about specific uh, member states inside the NATO and the political willingness of the NATO to accept Ukraine. That's, I believe, it's something that you are asking 
um, and we as Ukrainians asking ourselves so when, how, under which uh, perspectives. Of course, uh, everyone uh, from Ukraine, uh, civil society in particular, looks uh, uh, on the July agenda. July is the time for uh, annual, uh, but this time very memorial, 75th uh, NATO Washington summit. And uh, we were thinking, so apart from writing the security assurances with uh, Ukraine, um, U.S. could uh, make a much more of a message, not only NATO member states, but united with the member states to other parts of the world, saying that not only Ukraine will be a member, but Ukraine will be a member of NATO when and how. That's uh, the precision framework. So when, how, it means by which conditions, yeah, that's something that we are very much expecting and working on um, intensively with our partners yeah, as a civil society organization, think tank, in other countries, with the organization, for example, but with other, uh, uh, others from the NATO member states, in order to make sure that we elaborate um, this understanding and the timely concern that we already talked about. Because, yes, we already have a Vilnius uh, communique or Vilnius declaration last year when the NATO annual NATO uh, summit was taken on with the perspective of Ukraine somehow when we don't know to become a NATO member state but we want to make sure that it happens already and there are already not only economic but also political preconditions to that. Of course our eyes uh, look more to uh, what we say Atlantic partner of NATO United States in particular, where the concerns are that um, Ukraine is not ready and it might be ready to join NATO only after or when Ukraine wins and have a full victory. And this precision to have a full victory itself and to win, uh, that's something that we as Ukrainians see as a, uh, already being a precondition of being a member state of NATO. So it should happen in a parallel tracks. Um, I want to maybe foresee some of the questions that, Sergei, you might think, or your audience who will be listening to this podcast in particular might see. Um, well, there is a kind of a stereotype, or it, at least it used to be a stereotype before that the expansion of NATO was the precondition why the Russian Federation attacked Ukraine, right? So it was a very common knowledge uh, for a lot of communities in 2022, but also in 2023. As a picture now in 2024, I might say two arguments that are against that. Firstly, in Finland. Uh, uh, already became a partner or actual member, to be precisely, of NATO. So expanding its uh, uh, borders and uh, NATO literally being on the borders with the Russian Federation, but Sweden as well. Uh, did something happen to them? Not at all. So it means that uh, this uh, uh, idea uh, that sometimes politically blocks or sometimes some expert societies blocks to the vision to have a full victory for Ukraine, at least to help Ukraine in order to gain this full victory. Um, we say that um, these arguments that the expansion of NATO was uh, used as something uh, why the Russian Federation attacked uh, shouldn't be the argument as well in 2024. The argument should be or why Ukraine is not still winning with all together. So what it makes sure, or how to make sure that Ukraine not only wins, but have a full victory. These, I believe, are the key questions that we should ask our Western partners. But we, as Ukrainian experts, make sure that we are providing necessary, not only questions, but answers to that. We are definitely ready to uh, uh, both receive the military aid and support and supply of all uh, possible ammo, but also uh, far launch missiles, uh, in particular that you mentioned uh, your country in Germany is making uh, intensive debates whether to exchange uh, the Taurus to the British storms and to then to in such a way uh, to overcome, uh, let's say, the political shape and political discussions or dilemmas for some of uh, the representatives still to support Ukraine on time. Because uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Sergei, it's very important that we do that on time and as soon as possible. And, uh, and it's not about as long as it takes formula, it's now. And uh, as you know, when we are talking about military uh, cooperation in particular and planning uh, and delivery 
on time is a kind of a very essential thing to support uh, not only the militaries but also civilians in Ukraine, which are uh, literally making sure that uh, um, each and every drone attack or a missile attack is not hitting their homes uh, for for a moment, and that's why a political dimension of the discussions, so which uh, ammunition, but also in particular which military aid to provide to Ukraine. It's something that has been long uh, debated, and that's why the length of this discussion sometimes is immeasurable. In Ukrainian framework, you know, time is a very different uh, uh, concern, and uh, we make sure that uh, our response is, uh, uh, is making it as quick as possible. Of course, we definitely understand the partners in the West that will take much more time politically to um, negotiate and discuss these matters in particular. I only mentioned Germany, but it's not only the one country that we are, have or have to talk about. Of course, UK, we have to talk uh, then a priority for, let's say, creative approach sometimes that uh, even the Minister of Foreign Affairs, David Cameron, was making it sure that uh, talking to her vis-a-vis -vis Analia Barbok, you know, making sure that this request for the exchange of the missiles was never something done before. So it's a very creative approach, you know, the partners thinking about the future of Ukraine and also their future to some extent. Of course, here is the talks about France and uh, um, his again announcement in the upcoming weeks to still visit uh, Kyiv. As you know, uh, the visit was planned um, to be in February, but then was cancelled. Still, after the um, talks with Volodymyr Zelensky himself with President Macron, make sure that uh, President Macron will um, make it happen. So we will literally think that this visit is not only political momentum of when uh, France and Ukraine signed the security assurances, but it's a kind of a concrete what we say, how these security assurances are making sure they are transformed into the action plan. Action plan with concrete deadlines, con uh, concrete, uh, let's say, uh, indicators, you know, and a concrete cooperation in this sense. Uh, we know that uh, our partners from the Baltic states and Poland are making uh, their efforts to do so as well. And uh, it's not a secret that uh, Baltic states' representatives, in particular Estonia, is now where Yusuf Kid is coming from, uh, is uh, um, elaborating the framework for the security assurances with Ukraine. So something that we expect more countries uh, in a nutshell in March, April and May to sign uh, with Ukrainian security assurances, which are sometimes politically said as security guarantees, but to make sure that it's not some, somehow the same thing uh, that we are talking about. And um, we have to mention also one more partner, which is um, definitely from the Scandinavian and Sweden and Finland and Norway, <clears throat> so three uh, countries from the, um, let's say, Scandinavian profile, which important to mention not only Finland, but uh, now Sweden, uh, Sweden is a member of the NATO, so we do have um, uh, the Baltic states uh, being protected by what we say NATO Lake. Uh, so the cooperation with this country intensifies with Ukraine, also with security assurances, but also military aid that these countries are providing. But on the south side from uh, what we say the old members of the EU, Italy is one of the very interesting partner now trying to liberate its framework, uh, not only politically, but also as we understand economically, how to boost presence uh, of uh, its efforts. Uh, uh, and um, just on another side, um, very important question here to answer is not only the military aid, but how Ukraine will be able to economically recover. When we're talking about the procurement uh, system and, of course, uh, the um, how the uh, ammo, if we talk about the ammo, let's say, uh, um, should be produced and then supplied to Ukraine, it takes definitely time. And the preparation for that should have been started, which is the case. But it's true that uh, uh, those, uh, um, let's say, uh, ammos that already been delivered to Ukraine, they were in stock of the countries that were providing them and they vacated their stock, that's for sure. That's why uh, EU is thinking about uh, enhancing their industrial defense capacity, as we know. And there is also the strategy to do that, and uh, there is also an idea to have a special commission on that, an open office in Kyiv. 
What stops that? Well, interest, definitely, as we say, sometimes political interest, uh, because uh, it provokes also the questions simultaneously to many European communities who, as we know, also go on elections apart from uh, not only uh, United States, potentially UK as well, we don't know, we will know in the upcoming weeks, uh, uh, to explain the question of uh, conscription, because if we uh, expand the defense uh, capabilities and uh, productions, and potentially politicians are not sometimes ready to answer the questions of conscription, for example, so to boost in the uh, production is it only for Ukraine, or is it how how the uh, it potentially might be used and for what? Um, the societies uh, are in Europe. I'll be talking in Europe in general, so not only you. Uh, they are very much accommodated with the democracy, and sometimes democracy makes it so comfortable, which we definitely understand, and that's what Ukrainians truly want. But uh, um, in order to be potentially uh, safeguard this democracy, we need uh, these capabilities to be present. And it also involves training of personnel, uh, because capabilities without personnel and uh, are thinking about logistical chains, uh, uh, how they're going to be uh, supported and supplied, um, uh, that's something that uh, doesn't uh, should be considered as well. Uh, war is mathematics as well, so it's definitely about numbers, how much of what and when. So the time concern, the uh, the volume concern, but also the uh, the times when the production lines can be elaborated. That's something that is on our agenda as well. Um, and to make this very, maybe my uh, vague answer to you, but at the same time with some concrete messages, uh, uh, Ukrainians are very open, and we do believe that military production in Ukraine is one of the solutions. But we also need the transition solutions as of now, because in order to win as soon as possible, we need already the solutions uh, to be elaborated and uh, being implemented now. And this term now, it's not as soon as it takes, but it's now already definitely as a very something concrete. So that's why my prospects for 2024, which might be, it is a challenging year for sure, is that when the political leaders are coming to Ukraine and making their discussions, as they are, we are discussing a very concrete action plans in these concerns and in this. to remember that the war started 10 years ago, not two years ago, so we actually are into the 11th year of conflict, and after 11 years, with Russia having every advantage, they still only control 20%. Their Air Force and Navy have failed in all of their critical tasks, and half a million Russian soldiers have been killed. So don't. I would not focus so much on yet last year's counteroffensive, but step back from the map and think about where we are. And this was done without a strong, decisive commitment from the United States to help Ukraine win. So I actually am quite optimistic. I think that, you know, Russia is actually in deep trouble. Now, three things. Number one, we have to make it clear that we want them to win, that it is our strategic objective that Ukraine wins. Germany has to do the same thing, make it very clear, and then provide the support that's needed for them to win. Number two, uh, Ukraine needs long-range precision strike capabilities uh, that will enable them to make Crimea untenable and that will neutralize Russia's advantage of mass. That means the capability to destroy artillery, headquarters, logistics, at long range. That's a capability that we should provide them. And then the third thing, Ukraine is going to have to fix their personnel system. They've got enough people, but they don't have enough soldiers. And so this is going to require uh, political decisions, political fixes, changing laws, and then for the government in Kyiv to explain to Ukrainians why they have to get more people to expand the size of the army so that they can have enough units to rotate. First of all, we should recognize that these are threats, bluster, and it's a part of the Russian repertoire uh, or their arsenal, just like artillery, just like rockets, is disinformation. 
constantly threatening people. Um, and I think we in the West should quit overreacting to all of these threats, be firm in our resolve, be clear in our objective, and then push back on it. The Russians will complain every time we do, but they actually only respect strength. When we are, when we cower or we're like, oh, we don't want to provoke, <laughs> that just makes them want to do more. And I don't understand why we still have a hard time uh, acting with confidence and decisiveness instead of always worrying that we might provoke them.